Judges 16, verse 4 to 31. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see, if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his strength, of his great strength, and how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him, each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any man. Then the rulers of the Philistines uh, brought uh, her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried and she tied him with them. When with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of uh, uh, string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with a man hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, Thank you, thank you very much, my good brother. Uh, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, but he snapped the ropes off his arms uh, as if uh, they were threads. Delilah then said to him, all this time you have been lying, you've been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me you can, how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head in the fabric on the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric and tightened it with a pin. Again, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and pulled up the pin and the loom with the, fab with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you? A number of people know that. Have you had that in your house? How do you say you love me and you're not doing this? Eh? Or you're not doing the other one? <laughs> okay. How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't uh, told me the secret of your great strength. Uh, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. Uh, so he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazareth dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head was shaven, uh, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the, the seven braids of his head and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Then he say, then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from uh, his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and took, down, took him down to Gaza, binding him with uh, bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the 
prison, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When they, uh, the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was uh, crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. On, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me uh, with one blow uh, get revenge on the Philistines for my uh, two eyes. Then Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood bracing himself against them uh, uh, against them his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other samson said let me die with the philistines then he pushed with all his might and uh, down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it thus they killed many more when he died than while he lived then his brothers and his mother's uh, father's whole family went down to get him they brought him back and buried him between Zora and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. <coughs> My brother did not like a dry preacher. So he gave me some water. So. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> some of us would know either the comic or the movie series Superman. Anyone here ever watch Superman? Any of his films? Superman. Oh goodness me. I'm too old to have watched Superman. <laughs> they watch different things but uh, uh, Superman is a movie you can watch it uh, it's an interesting movie he is this indomitable uh, individual but very benevolent uh, because he fights crime wherever there is a crime he appears uh, and he can't be defeated uh, he's wearing a, 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 a cape on his shoulders he's wearing a, a red uh, uh, suit and he's wearing an underwear uh, and uh, he, he on top uh, uh, on top of his, uh, his suit uh, and, and he is fighting everywhere and no one can defeat uh, superman he uh, he is uh, coming he came suddenly, landed all of a sudden uh, uh, on, on the backyard of a family uh, from a planet called Krypton. And he landed as a baby. This family took him, raised him up. They did not know that he had some supernatural strength. And uh, he had come from this other planet. And it turns out he grows up, he has this supernatural strength that performs things. He can fly, he can uh, 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 do very many amazing things. Uh, but the planet where he comes from has a certain uh, 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 material, a certain uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, material that emits radiation and this material is called krypton, uh, kryptonite the material is called kryptonite and when it emits radiation and that radiation falls on any individual who has come from krypton it knocks them out and completely removes their strength so however strong those individuals from Krypton may be, the moment the radiations and the rays of Kryptonite hits them, they lose their strength. They become as weak as any ordinary man because of the rays of Kryptonite. 
And this is, uh, I think, uh, what our leaders had in mind when they chose this topic. They began thinking, what is this about men that is like kryptonite in their lives? That when it begins to reach out and touch them with their rays, men become weak. <laughs> their knees cannot hold anymore. They cannot stand anymore. What are these things that happened in the journeys of men, in the life of men that tend to expose their inner weakness? If I may use another uh, Greek mythology, uh, Achilles. Achilles was this young boy and as a little baby, his mother took him and his mother actually put him in a river Sitax and, and, and dipped him in this river holding to his, uh, his feet, uh, his ankle. The mother dipped him into the river and when he came out of the river, no sword, no spear, no arrow, nothing could actually pierce the life of Achilles. So Achilles went around doing great battles in Greek era and defeating people all over the place. But remember, when the mother dipped him into the water, the mother was holding the ankle. The ankle became the only place that did not get inside the river stacks. And that ankle became known as Achilles' heel. The weak spot. That area that seems to uh, 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 expose an individual. And so Achilles was finally killed when someone aimed an arrow at that heel and the arrow pierced through the heel. That is how Achilles was finally healed. What are the Achilles heel of men? What are those weak spots of men that tend to bring us down again and again? It is surprising how many a mighty man have been brought down by exposure to some kind of kryptonite or some kind of a, a, a heel that was never treated from their background, from their area, and from their territory. Even some that seem to have been doing very, very well, they reach a certain stage and you begin to see they are not doing as well as we thought they were doing. As the African saying goes, the pot breaks near the door of the hut. And many, a pot of many men have spilled the water just before they entered into their house as a result of those weak spots and those weak areas in our lives. <clears throat> Most of us are quite familiar with the three areas that sometimes are listed as major areas in the life of, uh, of, of men. Sexual scandals, financial greed, and abuse of power. Some would call that uh, women, wealth, and winning. Some would call them girls, gold, and glory. Whichever way you may put them, uh, these three have been taken as some of the greatest weak areas. But I normally would add four when I'm dealing uh, with Christians uh, uh, and a fifth one. The fourth one I would add is the area that touches on, on uh, doctrine, being grounded. Because when a man goes into error in doctrine, you have shakahola. You have shakahola. So I usually would add a fourth one, and sometimes I add a fifth one, which is a little common, but majority of us have not come to experience or to recognize what it is. And the fifth area, which often is not talked about, is an area that I call burnout. Some of us like the claim is better to burn out than to rust out. And many of us would ascend to this statement without giving a, balan a balancing option. Burnout leads an individual to lower their guards. Burnout leads an individual to become weary, depressed, 
to be tired of resisting sin, tired of fighting the devil, tired of reading the Bible, tired of praying, tired of everything, tired of even serving the Lord. It leads one into a crisis situation where the motivation within is not there anymore. You just sit back at home and you do not even participate in church activity. You become the play field of the devil because of burnout. Allow me to take you to my own personal journal that I wrote 2nd March 1984 at 6.24 p.m. I wrote this. How many of you were born 1984? 2nd March 1984 at 6.24 p.m. I wrote this in my personal journal. For a truth, there is something going on in the inside of me. It makes me moody and desire to shun company of people. Sometimes I even have a feeling that I'm afraid. I like spending most of my time alone thinking and sometimes there's such a feeling over me that I begin to think I am backsliding. There's something going on in the inside of me that I cannot run away from. The problem is, I don't know whether it is good or bad. I have thought that maybe it is the devil taking advantage of these situations around my life to buffet me. So I have bound and rebuked to no avail. I have again comforted myself that after all, the righteous shall live by faith, not by feeling, and still, I cannot have a breakthrough. As far as the outward show is concerned, I am still a Christian. I read my Bible, though sometimes I read a whole chapter and wonder what it is all about. It's like reading a telephone directory. I pray, even though sometimes it's so stereotyped, and then I begin feeling as if my prayers are dripping down my chin and falling to the ground. When I meet Christians, I sometimes even greet them, praise the Lord. I, of all the people who has been a blessing to so many people, am now fearing to attend any meeting where I am known, lest someone should ask me to preach. A sister wrote to me the other day that she was passing through a period of a spiritual dry spell, if I may use her words. She needed help. Up to now, I have not written back. For how can I help her when it seems I am the one passing through the greatest spiritual dry spell of my life? Or is it that I have been worrying too much until I have forgotten that all things work out together for good to them who are called according to his purpose? People even ask me when they notice, uh, for they seem to notice it from uh, when they constantly ask you, are you sick? The look of disbelief in their faces when I answer that I am fine tells its own story. I also wonder whether I am headed for what has been called a breakdown or a burnout. One thing is certain, I cannot continue like this. This might be a winning time and a time to move to another level altogether. I think I will adopt the attitude of Habakkuk who said, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I'll answer when I'm reported, reproved. Well, I feel a little better now. It is as if I have shared with a person and emptied my heart to him. This was actually a letter that I wrote to God. I'm glad this morning I'm talking with people who have never gone through anything like that. <laughs> that they are always on a high level, soaring like eagles, 
never experiencing any moments of discouragement, stress, challenge, times when it seems like darkness is heaving all over them. But sometimes, what happens on our day-by-day -day life, although we may deny it, reveals that we are passing through what someone has called marginless life. Don't I remember that morning when I dashed to the shoe stacks, picked up my shoes and rushed to the car with my son in the tow because I was getting late and dropping him to school. I drove him to school, then drove back to the house to pick up some items that I'd left home before going to the office. And as I removed my shoes at the door, I noticed I had worn two different sets of shoes, one black and the other one brown, as I rushed out. You are experiencing marginless life when you are in such a rush that you cannot notice that you have two different shoes on your feet. I'm sure that the people I'm talking to do not experience such things. No, you are not the kind of person who get to the office and then you realize that you had even forgotten to comb your hair, certainly not you. You are not the kind of person who carries work at home in the evening to work late. No, not you at all. You are not the kind of person who sometimes clocks 14 hours a day, work instead of 8 hours. Certainly not you. You are not the kind of person who sometimes do not see your children for two days because when you get home they're asleep and when you leave they're still asleep. No, not you. You are not the kind of person who recently has become very irritable with friends, colleagues, and spouse and children attempt to avoid your way because words come lashing out. No, you are not the person who is struggling with deadlines in your life. You certainly are not the one who has been experiencing outbursts of anger, change of sleep patterns, change in eating patterns, exhaustion, and sometimes even depression. Or oh, was it you I saw the other day driving on the streets of Eldorado, overtaking a traffic jam and moving on? No, you are not that kind of a person. But perhaps you've identified with one or two things that I've mentioned, including going on to the extent that you have lowered your guard to such an extent that areas where you formerly would not have allowed anything to creep in. A few years ago, you knew you were saved and you drew boundaries quite clearly in your life. You knew this is my boundary and nothing will creep into that boundary. All of a sudden, that boundary has been lowered and things that you would not have even imagined five years ago, 10 years ago, you've started allowing them in your life and in creeping over into those boundaries that you used to have. Boundaries. Pornography. Boundaries of flirting with women in the office or women that you know. Boundaries. Thinking that your wife may not be as beautiful as she used to be. Boundaries of sleeping with your girlfriend, those who are not married. Boundaries. If so, you are living a marginless life and been exposed to some kind of kryptonite. Gordon MacDonald was a pastor. And in a counseling situation with a woman, he began meeting this woman repeatedly to the extent they developed closeness and finally ended up becoming intimate. Slept with this woman. 
pastor of a big church in the USA, a world known preacher, has written several books. And God on MacDonald was so overwhelmed, overcome, he went and he told his wife what he had done. Together they got the elders of the church and they began walking with him. The woman decided to go public with what had happened. He had to resign from his church, took a period of time walking with elders. And then finally he wrote these words. Weariness often leads to something called burnout. One simply loses the will to pursue dreams and sense of mission. More Christians than any of us know have made decisions that they will regret for the remainder of their lives under the influence of fatigue and burnout. And what do we learn from this? How to monitor the times and circumstances in which such weariness and its ultimate product, burnout, are likely to occur. And then we learn to avoid such extreme conditions or ask for help from others. Have you made some wrong decision because you're fatigued, exhausted, experienced burnout in your life? ran into the arms of another woman rather than your wife to console you or become addicted to substance, addicted to pornography, addicted to alcohol, addicted to marijuana, nursing the bottle because of burnout in your life. It's Twala Paris who sang and said, they don't know that I go running home when I fall down. They don't know who picks me up when no one is around. I drop my sword and cry for just a while because deep inside this armor, the warrior is a child. Indeed, the warrior is a child wearing on the armor. But deep inside this armor, the warrior is a child which when exposed to a, a kryptonite becomes as weak as any other person. Even giants have their own difficulties. They also face their own challenges. As one TV program used to run many years ago, even the rich also cry. He does not spare us pastors as well. He does not spare leaders. Now, when exposed to a kryptonite, if we do not have that inner strength, we become as weak as any other person. But Samson was a child of his time. Someone may say the challenges we are experiencing are challenges that are unique to our generation only. And yet the book of Judges shows us that a time when Samson Lee lived was marked by idolatry, family foods and fights, injustice, child sacrifice, the modern day abortion, homosexuality, rape, and even kidnapping. In fact, four times we are told that there were no king in Israel in those days and twice the lifestyles of the people is summarized with the phrase and everyone did what was right in their own eyes for there was no king in Israel. Judges 17 verse 6, 18 verse 1, 19 verse 1, 21 verse 25. 
Due to this kind of lifestyle, the Lord gave them over time and time again to their enemies who ruled over them and oppressed them as instruments of judgment. Whenever they cried out to the Lord, he would raise up a deliverer who would bring judge, uh, 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 who would judge them on behalf of the Lord and, uh, and, and vindict a, a kind of a defeat on their enemies. They would be set free. But as soon as the deliverer was gone, the Israelites would go back to their styles and so the vicious circle would continue. It is in this leisure fair kind of attitude that we also see in the life of Samson that almost borders on defiance of all authority, including parental authority. Samson truly was a child of his time, born as a child of angelic promise to a parents who were initially barren. He comes out to us as a child of destiny. In one of the theophanic appearance of God in the Old Testament economy as an angel, in one of the theophanic appearances of the Lord, he gave Manoah and his wife the promise that they were going to be the parents of a son and strict prenatal and postnatal instruction was given to them on how they need to care for the pregnancy and for this child. Into this dark period of history of Israel, Samson was born. His name has that Hebrew suffix O-N at the end which usually is used to refer to something very small, something tiny. And perhaps uh, Samson was not a giant as we have all thought. Uh, perhaps uh, Samson was a tiny person, or maybe it was a nickname, as sometimes we talk of uh, Tiny Sam when we are referring to a rugby giant uh, who uh, can uh, crush you with his arms. But the name means he is one who is like the sun, Phil Stanton points out that various uh, similarities between uh, Samson can be drawn with some Greek mythologies, uh, including uh, Hercules, uh, who was also very strong, and, uh, uh, and Stanton thinks uh, this Greek mythologies, uh, mythologies uh, must have borrowed the story from Samson. But Samson was not a myth, uh, but a deliverer whom God raised. As a matter of fact, he seemed to have operated mainly in the western part of Israel rather than in the whole nation. To many people, he appears more like an amorous teenager who could not control his passions and as a man who had more brawn than brains. And yet, we cannot take Samson lightly because of what the scripture says about him. He was a charismatic leader who was frequently stirred up by the Spirit of the Lord. For we find this phrase written again and again about him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, stirred up by the Spirit of the Lord. And he would go into accomplishing certain supernatural and miraculous feats that would deliver the children of Israel. Samson also appears in the list of heroes in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And what more shall I then say for time would fail me to mention of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, and of Samuel, and Sa uh, of Samson, and goes on, who through faith subdued kingdom, wrought righteousness, works valiant in faith, put to flight the armies of alien, out of weakness were made strong, and on and on, referring to people like Samson. So we cannot take Samson lightly. Samson was a man of God in spite of his weaknesses. But perhaps, as someone has said, charisma without character leads to catastrophe. This is seen in the life of Samson, a very charismatic leader that doesn't have the character to match his charisma. In spite of his temper and vengeful attitude, he was an extraordinary man, except for weakness. These were some things that appeared to bring Samson down, his kryptonite. First of all, the way he handled his dedication to God. You see, Samson was a Nazarite. 
but he lives his life in a way with his long seven flowing wigs, uh, uh, weaves that were like a, 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 a Mau Mau fighter. You would probably call him today because he was also very poeti poetic coming up with the songs. We would call him Rasta Sam. And Rasta Sam goes around quoting his poem. He said, with the jawbone of Avanaz, I bashed up a few heads. With the jawbone of Avanaz, I bashed up a few heads. That's Rasta Sam for you. But his hair was a symbol of dedication. He had never touched wine. He, the way he treats corpses, he was not supposed to, treat, to touch a corpse as a, as, as, as a Nazarite. And yet he finds a dead lion. He scoops some honey out of him and he goes out of it and he goes declaring, out of the eater has come forth something sweet. His poems again. He treats his Nazarite position, which was a symbol of dedication and commitment to God, with such casualness amounting almost to content. To the extent he finally allowed Delilah to actually shave his head. If he had taken his Nazarite dedication with some seriousness, with some true commitment, I am a Nazarite and I need to live like one. But he is very casual about it. Very casual. And this is a kryptonite that brings down many of us as believers that although we are committed to the Lord as men, although we have this engagement with God, yet the way we treat our commitment, very casual, we can trade it easily for something else. But secondly, Samson is struggling with obedience and temper management. He is stubborn and insisted that the parents had to get him a Philistine girl for a wife, although it was contrary to their expectation. But he says, I saw a girl on the other side. Get me that girl. And so when he went for the marriage, the Philistines tricked him and he decided to get the clothes for the Philistines who had discovered his riddle and then walked away in a half. He burned the fields of the Philistines using his foxes. The Philistines showed him that two can play a game with fire. They burned his wife and the family. He has lack of submission to authority, a kind of a rebellious, a, a postmodern attitude in the life of Samson that completely rejects authority. Parental authority, God's authority, government authority. I am my own man and I do what I want to do in my life. Thirdly, Samson did not guard his relationship with women. First, he's engaged with this beauty of Timna, the wedding that never was. Then a prostitute from Gaza. You need to know that Gaza was the headquarters of the Philistines. So it's like having Osama bin Laden in Washington. <laughs> and then the sweetheart from the valley of Sorek, named as Delilah. Haven't you noticed 
the trend of lowering his guard slowly by slowly. First, he tells Delilah that I have not been tied with cords. If you tie me with seven cords, very far from the source of his strength. Second, he says, bring new ropes. Still far. Third, he goes closer to the source of his strength. Weave my hair, but pin it down. Finally, he shave my head reveals the source of his strength. Sometimes when kryptonite begins working in the life of a man, it is not instantaneous. It is a process. A process that started slowly by slowly on what you thought you could control. You thought you were in charge. Then going on, crossing the boundaries. It is that this man that I like to talk about, who actually lived in a clan where they were not allowed to eat porcupine. Because the laws of the Quran said, you shall not eat a porcupine. But someone found the man hunting for a porcupine. Told him, why are you hunting for a porcupine? Don't you know what our law says? And the man says, the law says, don't eat a porcupine. It does not say, don't hunt a porcupine. Someone found him carrying a porcupine on his shoulders. I said, what are you doing? Don't you know what our law says? He said, I know what the law says. The law says, don't eat a porcupine. It does not say, don't carry a porcupine. <laughs> Someone found him skinning a porcupine. <laughs> what are you doing? Don't you know what the law of our clan says? Yes, I know. The law says, don't eat a porcupine. It does not say, don't skin a porcupine. Someone found him roasting a porcupine. <laughs> Say, don't you know what the law says? I know what the law says. The law says, don't eat a porcupine. It does not say, don't roast a porcupine. Someone found him tasting a porcupine. <laughs> Don't you know what the law says? He said, I know what the law says. The law says, don't eat a porcupine. It does not say, don't taste a porcupine. Unfortunately, he tasted the whole porcupine. <laughs> How many of you have tasted the whole porcupine? You started from far, you thought you'd control, slowly by slowly moving the boundaries, moving the boundaries until you've consumed the whole porcupine. <laughs> My time is out. Let me skip a number of things. Let me just share many, many things that I would have wanted to say, as I mentioned. Let me just share uh, uh, some closing remarks here. Uh, Samson was a lone ranger. He walked alone. Unlike all the other judges we find in the uh, book of Judges, uh, they mobilized a team, rallied support and worked together. Samson was a lone ranger. My brothers and sisters, there are no sisters here today. We are only brothers. Please, don't be a lone ranger. Who are your closest friends? Who is this person that you can share with when you are going through deep, deep things that you can never share with any man? This friend who, you know, you can be open and tell them who you actually really are. And you know so and so will not betray me. 
So and so will not kill me. They will not despise me. They will not disassociate from me. They will not treat me. I said, even you, you also, you could do that. How could you? Someone who will take me and walk with me. Who is your friend? Don't be a lone ranger. Do not presume on the power of God that you can just rise up just like the other time. No. It requires fresh engagement and walk with the Lord on a day by day basis. It is not just like the other time. But please not. Perhaps you have allowed kryptonite to poke some holes in your armor and suit. Our God is the God of a second chance. Don't we see the hair growing? Don't we see Samson getting hold of that pillar? Don't we see him praying and crying out to God, this one more time, Lord, just this one more time? And pushing those pillars, killing more Philistines than he had ever killed in his lifetime. Our God is the God of a second chance. So please, beware. Beware of these potential areas. Beware of when you are weak. Beware of your anger management. Beware of your relationship with those of opposite sex. Beware and allow God to help you. One of the ways in which the Lord helped me after going through that kind of period I went through that I mentioned to you for close to three months. I set aside even after work, I would lie on my bed and worry. It would be worry time. Then the Lord led me to the book of Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 6. My brothers were angry with me and they made me the keeper of vineyards, while my own vineyard have I not kept. Here I was running all over the district then, preaching in high school, carrying my guitar, singing and preaching, keeping the vineyards of other people, my own vineyard had I not kept. I read my Bible to get my next sermon out of the Bible, prayed for my next mission, rather than taking time to build myself up in the innermost part that I may be transformed and I may be built up. And God began showing me, you are busy keeping the vineyards of other people. Keep. Work on your vineyard. A place where you reconnect with God again through practicing Christian disciplines, Bible reading, engagement in prayer and fasting, and acknowledging God in your life. That this builds us up so that we are able to stand. Put some checks and balances in your life that will not allow you to go to certain extent I like talking with my pastors on what I call the Billy Graham rule. The Billy Graham rule simply says, do not be alone with a woman in a situation that can compromise you. So I don't give a right to a woman in my car alone. Unless my wife is with me, the other day, a policeman stopped me and uh, he had a colleague, a lady colleague, and he said, could you just give a ride to this lady uh, uh, to, what if you have an accident? And then people begin saying, the Bishop of Sitam was with a woman in his car. <laughs> Where did he pick up a woman? Where did he get that? Do you see what I'm trying to talk about? I don't meet a woman outside my office. And I meet them in my office when my secretary is there. I don't meet a woman like, let's meet in this hotel or let's meet here uh, so that the council can continue on. I don't meet with any woman 
unless my wife is there outside my office I don't what are some checks and balances that you have put in place Lord we pray that you help us as we continue to serve you our heart's desire is to be faithful to you but like myself Lord perhaps there may be a brother or here today who may have had struggles with burnout in their lives and other challenges that have made them become lax in guarding themselves I pray that you'd help me as I pray for my brothers also that you'd help us all help us to reconnect Lord where we have lost that connection and to come back to the space where you'll be honored and glorified we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name we pray.